Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm going to do the introduction whilst <laughs> the computer decides to update itself. Uh, my name is Anne Powells, and uh, I welcome you all today, but especially a speaker who's coming from actually Singapore via Genoa in uh, Italy. And uh, before I do an introduction of um, his talk and of Francesco himself, um, the reason for this talk is, um, there are various reasons, but I do want to identify, uh, originally uh, Francesco was going to do this for the course called Issues in World Englishes, so I am scanning the room for all the students in Issues of World Englishes, I'm seeing quite a few of them. Um, for you it is compulsory to be at this talk, so, um, and I hope you can ask some questions afterwards. But um, also the issue for the students doing Issues in World English is please follow the Moodle website in terms of um, arrangements for the strike weeks. So I would like you to check that um, regularly. Okay. Oh, I think we're nearly on board. So um, again, I'd like to welcome Francesco Cavallaro, who is um, Associate Professor at Nanyang Technology University and um, in the Department of Section, I don't know what it is anymore, but it's the Department of Linguistics and Multilingual That's Studies. Right. Um, and um, Francesco really is an authority on issues of multilingualism, and more recently, that is the last 20 years, hmm, more recently, with a major focus on what's happening in Singapore. I think the Singaporean situation is extremely interesting, both for the English um, elements, uh, the spread of English, but also about combining multilingualism and indeed um, in other languages and, and English. Um, I'm not going to do much more than ask him to um, perhaps start as quickly as possible. <laughs> uh, if you hmm. can get on board, there yep, should be. I, oh, uh, what happened to it? Oh, it's changed the uh, input. Okay. Hang on. Um, and ah, just one brief thing. He works both in quantitative and qualitative methods, but I think today you'll talk a bit more about census information. Is that correct? A more quantitative, a bit of quantitative. census and others. Okay. <laughs> and other stuff. Great. Thank you, Anne. Thank you for that uh, nice introduction. Good to be here. So nice to see so many of you um, on a rainy, cold day, or is this normal for uh, London? I have, coming from a tropical climate, I've had a, like I feel like I've had a constant cold for the last half uh, month. So bear with me, please. Um, okay, so this is the me, where I come from. Nice um, background, the Singaporean flag. I don't know how many of you. Anyone here from Singapore? Okay, so. You can sort of tell me what I'm saying wrong or something. You can correct all the mistakes. Or I can call on you to, uh, for some more input, if you like, if you uh, will allow me, uh, if need be. Um, okay. Sort of technical issues always. Yeah. It is on. That's OK. I'll just use the. Uh, this is what the uh, brief outline of my talk. Um, I'll be, of course, talking about Singapore. And as Anne said, I do a lot of work looking at quantitative um, data. Um, and for today, I'll be sort of looking or basing it on mainly on census data. I'll show you lots of census data from Singapore, the past and sort of current one. Um, and then also, especially with the students uh, in mind, sharing some sort of small research projects that we've conducted to sort of look into the census data a little bit more in depth and I'll explain why uh, that's needed in a little while. So we'll look at what shapes Singapore sort of linguistic, uh, I wouldn't call it word landscape, that's used for something else uh, these days, but the environment, hence my title, language worlds. Um, and then we look at the obvious causes. I mean, it's obvious that uh, some groups are shifting away from using their traditional languages to mainly English, as you'll see. And then we'll look at some of the reasons and some more data um, on that. And then I'll end with uh, a few thoughts about the future. Singapore um, sort of started as, well, the, was always there. It was always a Malay uh, settlement until the, the British came and claimed it with uh, the Stamford Raffles back in the early 1800s. And this is the population in thousands um, over the years. 
The interesting thing that you need to look at um, so much is the past few decades where we've seen a really, uh, from here onwards, let's say, a rapid growth in population, roughly like one million population increase every 10 years. And uh, the reason why it's in the decades is that's when the censuses are done in Singapore. They're done every 10 years with a mid-term um, census every five years, uh, hence the 2015. So we're on track for another sort of one million increase in this decade. So in a few years when the 220 2020 uh, census will be done, we expect that the population will have grown to 6 million. Um, and that's what the government wants. They want the population to grow to at least 7 million. And it's usually, for the, when the government says that, it's usually for economic reasons, which uh, we will not go in um, um, today. Let me put this away, otherwise I'll play with it. Um, Miraculously, or somehow, the Singapore government has managed to keep the ratio of the ethnic, major ethnic groups quite sort of constant throughout uh, uh, the decades. And I'll go into a little bit about this later on. As you can see, the majority are Chinese, ethnic Chinese, um, followed by Malays, who are sort of the next major group. And then there's another group of Indian um, Singaporeans. And this is, I say, quite, <coughs> no, no, restart later. I don't want to do that now. Let's have a look at one of the earlier censuses. We picked this time because this is around the time that Singapore became independent from uh, the Brits, or the, the British. The British were there for a long time, and then post uh, Second World War, there was a whole reshuffling of uh, statesmanships in that area with the, um, the development of, of Malaya becoming Malaysia, Singapore actually joining uh, this new federation for a few years, and then they um, agreed to separate again. So it's a quite a tumultuous uh, time around the time. But if we look at the languages spoken at home, remember the census, as I said, is quite a blunt tool. It just asks, what language do you speak at home? So it doesn't have the nuances uh, that we as linguists need. It should strike you that if uh, not the English, you know, this 1.8% of the households in Singapore spoke English, so it's a very small number. Maybe the other, next number should surprise you because it's 0.1 of the population had Mandarin as the home language. This is quite um, important. In the I'll uh, sort of make that in the next slide. Uh, so the major language sp uh, spoken in Singapore, because of, also because of the, uh, you know, the large um, majority of being Chinese, was actually Hokkien. Hokkien was understood by just about everyone in Singapore, especially all the Chinese, and it was the, the sort of the most widely spoken language in Singapore at that time. Then we had 60% uh, of the Indians who spoke Tamil, so even then we had non-Tamils uh, living in Singapore, and we had quite a large number of sort of uh, other um, languages uh, spoken at the time. Some of them are still spoken now in a sort of much smaller numbers, especially the Chinese as they call them in Singapore, they call them dialects, but we know they're not dialects. They're really Chinese languages uh, of their own. So I like to use the term Chinese vernaculars. Why is the issue that you know, only 0.1 of the population had Mandarin as the home language important? Because it was at that time also that Singapore decided on a four official language um, setup. They nominated Malay because of the Malay group, um, Tamil because it was the major Indian languages, and they chose Mandarin to represent the Chinese group, when, as I just showed you, no one had it as the home language, okay? So there are reasons for that, um, uh, but we, we won't go into the political reasons for that. Uh, the national language still is Malay, um, and it's in the Roman script because um, in the past, Malay was also written um, in Arabic, using Arabic um, script. They also had nice things in the Constitution, for those of you that are reading the second paragraph, about anyone being free to speak and teach and learn whatever language they wanted. We might come back to this later. At the same time, around, uh, around this time still, um, Singapore was trying to say, OK, how are we going to go forward with all our languages uh, in Singapore? So they, at that time, they decided on a um, education system which was um, sort of based on the vernaculars um, spoken there. So, uh, just this is 1955, but this is, they still haven't joined. They haven't fully detached from Britain, and they haven't joined uh, Malaya yet. But around to 1963 is when they joined Malaya. 1965 is when they separated from Malaya. So everything really happened um, after that. But the idea is that 
Uh, there were schools taught in Mandarin for the Chinese. Uh, there were um, schools in English for whoever wanted to go to these uh, um, schools, and there were schools taught in Tamil um, and Malay. And the idea was, and I think I've got it on the next slide, is that the vernacular schools would also teach English as a second language, while the English schools, uh, medium schools, would teach all the other official languages um, as second languages as well. Um, the reality of this is that the last Chinese medium school, that the Chinese were the longest that stayed, and it closed in 1987. By the mid-70s, all the Malay medium schools and all the uh, Tamil medium schools had closed. Not by the government, by uh, basically the parents voting with their feet, uh, with their feet or, and not enrolling their children in Malay medium schools or Tamil medium schools. They prefer to, for them to be enrolled in English medium schools, and as will become apparent um, in a minute. <clears throat> um, the idea, though, is um, that at that time, it was really, really important that you did your so-called mother tongue at school. It was counted for your, all your progress throughout um, um, Singaporean schooling. Things changed in the last 10, 15 years about the importance that these um, uh, subjects play uh, when you want to go ahead. I'll come back to this later. So let's move ahead um, sort of time-wise, and we jump um, a couple of decades, into, and we look at the 1980 census. So you can see the 1.8% from 1957 of English homes have now um, grown to 11.6%. We see an increase in uh, homes claiming to have Mandarin um, as the home language. And of course, from that, we have the decrease in the households that um, speak the Chinese vernaculars. Um, I'll give you some sort of table data. You can look at the other languages. But still, you can see the, home, the Chinese homes still a big presence of the Chinese vernaculars uh, in 1980. 1980 is an, an, another important year because in 1979, the Singapore government launched the Speak Mandarin campaign, where they basically told all the Chinese Singaporeans, don't speak these vernaculars at home anymore. Don't speak it to your children because they need to concentrate on learning Mandarin, and it will negatively impact their learning of Mandarin. Um, those of you that are linguists or educators here, you have to wonder, well, who's making these policies? That obviously, they were not linguists and educators. They were all engineers and lawyers. Um, but there, there are other political undertones for why uh, Mandarin was pushed um, at the time. And remember, in the 50s, um, China was communist. The Singapore passports were stamped with this red stamp saying, this passport is not valid for travel to China. And yet, they still chose Mandarin as the sort of mother tongue of the Chinese, Chinese Singaporeans. We'll come back to that if we have time. Let's jump another couple of decades uh, into the 2000 census, which is when things are getting interesting. The uh, population that uses English predominantly at home has doubled from 11.6 to 23. And the Homes that um, speak Mandarin at home have tripled. So everything is going fine. The government is quite happy with this. Um, yes, there are some people switching to English rather than the other languages, but they're more preoccupied with what's happening with the Chinese community, and they're growing quite nicely, um, the Mandarin speakers, that is. And the so-called dialects are decreasing um, every day. So now um, um, there's quite few of them. Just pause here for a second. I said um, the census data is always a, a blunt tool. Those of us that, or of you that may work with census data will understand this. They simply asked, what language do you speak at home? It doesn't account for bilingualism, it doesn't account for trilingualism, it doesn't account for any of the sort of switching that people do um, in their homes or in, um, uh, when they are multilingual. And the Chinese are quite diverse in Singapore. This is just a few. There's more. At least is, uh, uh, um, there's at least another four or five other Chinese groups. The Malays are also quite diverse. People think that all the Malays in Singapore are the same. They're not. A lot of them come from Indonesia, from different islands in Indonesia, and actually speak quite distinct languages, like Javanese or Boyanese. We have a different type of Malay that was spoken, and it's almost dead now, uh, Baba Malay, which the uh, um, local uh, uh, people who intermarried with Chinese and um, Malays who intermarried. The Indian community is also quite um, diverse as well. 
And the census doesn't pick this up. The census has asked for a language. We are lucky actually that they're still asking for Hokkien, Cantonese, and Teochew. So we have data for that, but none of the other um, Chinese vernaculars. We don't know who speaks Boyanese or Javanese from the census data. They don't pick that up. And the um, Indians, all they ask is, do you speak Tamil or other language? And all the other languages are lumped together. So um, if we want to know more about these groups, we need um, to do more work than just look at the census. But let's keep up with the census. This is the same data that I showed you before in a table form, so it's easier to see the changes um, across time. This is for the whole island. Then in a minute, I'll show you, I'll go into each ethnic group and show you the changes within each ethnic group. Okay, so this is everyone in Singapore who speaks English at home or Mandarin or Chinese vernaculars, Tamil and Malay. The two other censuses that I showed you before, so we can see the growth um, of English, the growth of Mandarin, the decline of the Chinese vernaculars, and sort of Tamil and um, Malay basically be, uh, keeping stable. If we add to 2010, we start seeing the first, for me, interesting aspect, um, because English is growing still, but in 10 years, the Mandarin-speaking homes have not increased, as was, you know, you could have sort of predicted uh, as a trend, uh, but that was not happening. If we add the midterm results from 2015, we still see this increase in English, uh, but we still see a stabilizing um, of Mandarin. Actually, I've got some Nice little arrows to show that. Increase in English, stabilizing in Mandarin and Tamil. Of course, we have a de continuous decrease in Chinese vernaculars. And this is, it's a little bit slower now because really it's only the old people that speak it. So the, what the census picks up is that the older people are passing away uh, rather than a, an actual shift. I haven't read it, um, um, arrow at the end because most people didn't expect the Malay community to start shifting um, as quickly as it has in the last 15 years. And I'll look at that in more detail in a minute. This is the same data in, table, in a sort of chart, for those of you that are more visually um, capable or, or prefer this. Again, the slopes of the English going up for the Chinese, the Mandarin stabilizing and the decline of the vernaculars um, and things like that. I'll come back to these uh, individually as I look at each ethnic group um, in a minute. So what do we have? If we look at what we have shown you so far, uh, we can see that uh, it, there's an obvious impact of the policies um, brought in by the government. One is, is the one I mentioned, which I'll mention again in a minute, the Speak Mandarin campaign for the Chinese group. Um, Singapore prides itself in having a bilingual education policy. Um, again, I, I'm not criticizing, especially for the Singaporeans in the audience, the, the government or anything like that. It's a great uh, education system. Um, the students do really well um, at it. The issue I have, of course, is with the term bilingual education. They say they have a bilingual education policy where really in the uh, schools, uh, there's nothing <coughs> taught in any of the mother tongues. What they, even the term mother tongue, remember, it's a term that the government imposed on each ethnic group. Your mother tongue, if you're Chinese, is Mandarin. Doesn't matter what you speak at home. If you're Malay, it's Malay. If you're Indian, it's Tamil. Although they've relaxed on the Indians. Uh, I'll get back to that in a second. So when you have an education system that is fully in English, um, and then the other languages are taught purely as um, second languages, you can see that there, there has, something has to give. We humans are quite sensitive to these uh, things, especially issues of status, issues of prestige, is issues of um, value, or instrumental value for what um, we, uh, we do and what we learn. So what we have um, to preempt the whole presentation in a way is, is an obvious shift to English by all groups um, in Singapore. Um, and I'll detail this in the next few slides with the title language shift. Let's have a look at the Indian community first. It's a smaller, so we'll start with them. And I've already told you it's about 9.1% now. Um, the official mother tongue for the Indian community is Tamil. 
but it's been about 10 years now that known, some known Tamil languages have been accepted by the uh, um, Singapore government and more importantly the Singapore Ministry of Education so that if you're not Tamil you can actually study Hindi or Punjabi or there's a couple of other um, languages at school. When before, 10, before, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, and all the time before then, no matter if you were Indian, you had to learn Tamil at school. You could apply to learn Malay uh, or Chinese, but nothing else. Okay. Um, I've already mentioned this. Um, the number that the census shows that speak um, Tamil um, in Singapore has dropped from the 60% in 1957, uh, but it's still at 37%. But it is uh, the group that has shifted to English uh, the most out of the three uh, um, ethnic groups. Um, that's right, Malayalam, Hindi, Punjabi, and Telugu are available um, for students at school. Some uh, have managed to get teachers into the school, others they need to go on a Saturday morning. But that means if you're Malayalam and you want to learn Malayalam, um, you don't have to learn um, Tamil as you did before. This is the same data I showed you before, uh, sort of just for the Indian. Group. So we have this continuing rise um, of English. We seem to have a stabilization of uh, Tamil um, over the last 15 years. We'll see what the, the next census will, will tell us. And then the other languages. There's a big group of uh, Indian Singaporeans who also speak Malay, uh, but they're decreasing. And again, it's the older um, in, uh, Indian Singaporeans. And then the others is all the other uh, languages lumped together uh, in the census. So I said we needed some more fine-grained um, data. This is a project that I did with one of my um, graduate students. And we basically tried to say, OK, we know you're multilingual. You're, if you're Punjabi, what language do you speak uh, with the people around you? We, in a way, if we look at it, the framework, this is more of a fishman type. If you can read the fine print, is we looked at, well, if you're at home or in a public where you, uh, people can hear you, and then different interlocutors. Who do you speak what with whom? And this is in a scale of one to seven. We just looked at uh, their choice of English versus Punjabi. Uh, the participants that we had were only Punjabi, and that was the only languages they had in common. Some of them knew a little bit of Hindi and whatever, but not enough to uh, conversing. What is obvious from here is that if we look at seven means only Punjabi, one means only English. Um, as the age um, of the group that we looked at um, goes down and as the age of the people that they speak to uh, decreases, the Punjabi decreases and the English increases. So they're definitely uh, still bilingual, um, although we're seeing the, the sort of young, not so much the younger ones, it's always this age group that seems to speak less of the traditional language. Um, we think it's because the younger group are still at school, so they're still um, learning uh, and using this language more than the next group who has just uh, left um, school. But some of them, with the younger people, speak very little Punjabi, even though they're bilingual. They can, we know they can speak it because when they speak to their grandparents or their parents, you can see at the left side of the chart, the numbers are quite high. If we go outside of the home, again, the, it's the older group that still speaks a lot of Punjabi with their close relatives, but even they speak a lot of English when they speak into younger people. So what's happening here is it's an obvious thing that yes, they're bilingual, but um, their, pref their preferred language with younger uh, interlocutors is English rather than their traditional language. And we'll come back to this. Not so much as with the, um, well, we'll come back to this. Anyway, if we look at English alone, looking at the latest result, we can start seeing some very high numbers of the um, younger um, Indian Singaporeans who claim to have English as a dominant language at home. Um, so it's quite um, obvious that the younger people are the ones who are leading this change um, to English. I'll put it in a chart for you so it's a little bit easier. This is 2005. It's quite high. You will, you'll see it when I show you the uh, um, Chinese and the um, Malays that this is sort of higher. Um, 
the younger people speak quite a bit of English, you have this dip and then you have a little bit of a hump again, which we um, assume these are the parents of the younger people. So that's it even correlates the fact that it's the home language, that's what they're speaking to each other, they're speaking English, and then it peters off um, as the... But even the older people speak quite a lot of um, English. If we look at the 2010, we see this line get higher, especially for the younger people. Um, and if we look at the 2015, it gets higher again. We have some interesting things happening. There's a really low dip there. Right? We think that that also it could be um, recent immigration to Singapore. We'll see whether we have time to talk about this later. Huh. How am I doing so far? I don't mind if you guys have a quick question, I'd rather you clarify it now, especially since I'm showing lots of data and graphs rather than sort of wait an hour and then try and remember uh, what we were talking about 45 minutes ago. Okay? Let's keep going. Let's have a look at the Chinese community in much the same way. I mentioned the Speak Mandarin campaign in 1979, um, and it was basically asking all the Singaporean Chinese to replace the so-called dialects uh, with man Mandarin. In effect, if I can summarize it very um, succinctly, is here is the government telling the Chinese community, forget about what your mother tongue is, okay, now, from now on, your mother tongue will be Mandarin. Um, if you were in that position, what would, be your re what would your reaction be? Would you say, yes, of course, yeah, okay, I'll stop speaking my native language and I'll start speaking Mandarin at home, or? Uh, so we've, I think they've had mixed results. I showed you already the, uh, uh, okay, this is what's happening. The uh, Lee Kuan Yew in 1979, um, they will, everyone will need, especially in the service industry, will need to speak uh, Mandarin. All taxi drivers, whatever, will need to have an oral Mandarin test, et cetera, et cetera. So they really went all out and they cut it out almost totally from the media. Um, Um, this is, and the, the idea was to promote Mandarin as the pan um, Chinese language um, um, in Singapore. So, so the, the, it was quite successful. You saw the census data I showed you before, I'll show it to you again in a minute, that the so-called dialects definitely decreased. They're almost all gone now. It's only the older Singaporean Chinese who speak it. Very few young people, they know a little bit, a smattering, they, uh, whatever, but very few have a real competence uh, in the language. And there was that increase in the household uh, that were using uh, Mandarin. Um, so definitely English and Mandarin have taken over from the vernaculars. That's quite obvious. Uh, the question is, is that did the Chinese all go all for uh, accepting what the new um, sort of, uh, directive from the government that now Mandarin will be a home language? What we see is that not all of them did. A lot of them went and bypassed Mandarin and went straight to using English as a home language instead and left Mandarin to be taught uh, by the school. And now really there's very few domains where you need um, either a vernacular or even Mandarin um, to survive. I don't speak Mandarin, I've been living in Singapore and because I don't need Mandarin in Singapore, I've been living there for 18 years and I really don't need uh, Mandarin. Um, but we can talk about that uh, as well later. Looking at the Chinese um, chart, it's as, um, the same numbers I showed you before. It's a steady uh, increase of English being spoken at home, that stabilizing of the use of Mandarin at home, and then de decrease um, in the Chinese uh, vernaculars. So as the Chinese vernaculars decrease, what we're now seeing is not a constant increase in Mandarin, but the constant increase is um, in um, English. A quick look at the data that we do have for uh, um, the uh, so-called dialects. Um, I had a student who, of mine who did this chart for me, but then she only sent me the photo or the image of it, so I couldn't change the word dialects. She put dialects, and she's Singaporean. They are so ingrained into them that they're dialects. Um, Chinese. Sorry? Oh, yeah, Mandarin, that's right. So when they, now when you talk about Chinese, that's right, Itesh. When you talk about Chinese, it's Mandarin. Yeah, yeah. Um, when before, I'm sure 40 years ago, if you said Chinese, people would say, well, oh, which one? Uh, not anymore. 
So this is a quite a nice chart because it shows you who's speaking these vernaculars, the, the ones in blue, and as you can see, it's the ones uh, uh, who are older, um, and while English um, and Mandarin are um, sort of spoken roughly by the same age, except that you see that the red uh, bars are higher for the younger people. And I'll give you more data of that in a minute. If we look at it only the vernaculars, just as a matter of interest, the blue bars are Hokkien, which is the most widely spoken. It's the biggest um, group within the Chinese community, and it's um, uh, the one that's spoken the most. Teochew is the uh, somewhat related to, uh, to Hokkien. It's the closest one. All the others, like a Cantonese speaker and a Hokkien speaker, if they spoke the two languages to each other, they would not be able to understand each other. So I said they're not dialects. Okay, the only ones who could sort of roughly understand each other are the Hokkien and Teochew. If we look at the family tree, sort of they come from the same branch, so they're somewhat related. Um, the interesting thing that we found here, um, and I need to test this in real life, is the yellow bars for the younger people. This is the Cantonese uh, groups, where we seem to see quite a large number of Chinese Singaporeans, young Chinese Singaporeans, claiming to speak Cantonese at home. I mean, these numbers don't uh, compare in any way with the English um, spoken. This is what we're talking about because this is only within that very small 12% group that speaks uh, a vernacular at home. So the numbers are still very small, but comparatively, when you compare the three major groups, it's interesting to see Cantonese seem seemingly having some sort of revival um, with the young people. Some of the people, some of the people attribute this maybe to the power of Hong Kong media whether it's um, Cantonese um, um, pop artists or Cantonese uh, uh, movies, which are very popular. All right. Another small group, this one, the Chinese are a bit of a challenge to try and survey because they are at least trilingual. So to use, to try and get them to, to, to understand uh, what language they're speaking with each other is, can be a bit of a challenge. This is another, it's a smaller group, uh, Hainanese, so again, to see who speaks it. And it's a smaller group, and you can see that even in the house, the three youngest sort of age groups, almost none of them speak it. There's very little um, Hainanese spoken. And interestingly, even the older people who claim to have a good knowledge of um, Hainanese, because we can see it, that they have really high numbers when they speak with their parents, so they're quite fluent or they claim to be quite fluent in Hainanese, when they're asked what language do you speak with a younger relative, it's English. Um, so English is becoming um, the, uh, the language um, for uh, um, this particular group. With the Hakkas, we tried, we, that's why you have three graphs, they said, okay, how much, who do you speak Hakka with, who do you speak Mandarin with, and who do you speak um, English with? Um, and you can see that the younger group speak no Hakka at all, um, and they show the highest usage um, of English. And all the groups are sort of mixed uh, in Mandarin. So again, it's a bilingual, at least a bilingual group still, the Hakkas. They do speak, even the younger people speak um, some uh, Mandarin, as you can see, but very little Hakka. So from being a trilingual community, all these, especially the smaller um, Chinese ethnic groups, are becoming um, bilingual in English and Mandarin, with English being the more dominant language. Um, and we've done other tests. We've gone around asking sort of random Singaporeans um, questions like this. This is quite a sizable group. Is, uh, do you speak more Mandarin and English at home? Yes, no. So they're quite equal, um, as you can see. So they're definitely still bilingual. I'm not saying that. Um, even those that claim to speak English at home only speak English. Although amazingly enough, we are getting more and more um, Singaporeans who don't speak uh, anything but um, English. They're still not that large, but they're, they're, they're becoming more uh, um, popular or more common. Uh, do you speak Mandarin, more Mandarin than English in public? Definitely not. So the um, language for the pub of, in a public language for the Chinese, at least the ones that we surveyed, seems to be uh, um, English. Speaking of English, then let's have a look at the uh, who speaks English within the Chinese community. The 2015 numbers, you can see the ones in brackets are quite high um, for the younger people. Uh, so there's definitely a shift to English 
that the census and even some of the data from uh, our smaller research projects that we've had um, um, show. If put it in a chart, 2005, 2010, and you can see the line just getting higher and higher and higher. Uh, those of you that may be better at statistics than me, you can try and project the trend to the next 50 years, and I'm sure you're going to see this line uh, being extremely high, um, especially with the young people. I um, don't know what I was trying to show you here. The difference with English and Mandarin in 2010. Uh, blue line is English, red line is uh, Mandarin. So in two, 2010, uh, only five years ago, it was still um, relatively high. What I wanted to show you is the contrast, the new blue, uh, purple line, sort of dropping uh, in only five years um, with these age groups. Um, so if you sort of go from the red line to the purple line. Uh, so what we're seeing is a steady increase in English, but a definite um, sort of collapse of the, of, among younger people, those that have uh, Mandarin as the home language. And this is just, again, to show you who speaks um, the vernaculars, and it's all, it's all the older people. Uh, that's why it uh, rises sharply uh, to, the, uh, to the right. Okay, Malay, quick look at. Uh, they're the safest in terms of numbers because the numbers we're looking at uh, who speaks English among the Malay community are relatively small compared to the other two groups. But what we need to see is that in only 15 years, the uh, households or, or the Singaporeans that claim to have English as the dominant language among the Malays has risen from 7.9% to a quite significant 21.5 in only um, 15 years. Um, so that trend for them is also that they're shifting away. Yes, you can see the Malay um, bars are really, really high, but the important thing for us is that they're sloping downwards, they're getting smaller um, every year. So when will they reach the sort of numbers of the Chinese and this, um, uh, the Chinese and the Indians? Another research project that we did um, with the Malays, again, to see who they speak to, what is the sort of the dynamics within the family. Um, and this is the older group, the 45 and above, but you can see that towards the, uh, the right, when they're speaking to younger relatives, they, even the older Malays claim to use quite a bit of um, English. This is again, seven means only Malay, one would be only English. Still quite high, but um, definitely a lot of English being used. If we go down in age, the next age group we, did, we surveyed, the bar is getting lower, especially on to the right and especially with the women. Then the 18 to 24, even lower across, uh, almost across the board, the only ones that, on, that get mostly Malay are the grandparents. So it shows that they can speak Malay. If they claim to use Malay with the grandparents, that means they can speak Malay, but the choice, the language of choice with even their parents or younger, uh, sort of um, their, their own uh, um, age group is, um, English, more and more English, or it's half and half because we're looking at from one to seven, we're in the middle. And so the younger people, they're still at school, but it's interesting to see that for some reason the, the women, the young Malay uh, women seem to be using more English um, than the males. So again, like all the others, the interlocutor seems to matter as the most important um, trigger for um, English, the younger, the people they are, the younger they are, the younger the people that they speak to, um, more English. Um, only the older people still um, use um, a significant amount of Malay, but we can see that is changing. If we look at, especially for the Malay, it's more important for the Malays because one of the reasons why people have said the Malay community has been keeping their uh, uh, language much better than the Indians and the uh, Chinese is because they are Muslim and all their um, religious ceremonies, religious um, uh, uh, is done in Malay, okay? And it used to be the case that if you, the, they went to the mosque on a Friday, the sermon almost always was in Malay. There are still lots of mosques that do Malay sermons, but a lot of them now instead has shifted to English because uh, the Muslim uh, community in uh, Singapore wants to be more inclusive. They don't just don't want to be 
uh, sort of Muslim mosques for the Malays. They want to be a mosque for every Muslim um, in Singapore. So they've shifted to more and more sermons. And we can see that red uh, line is when asked what sort of language do you use, it's still quite high across the board with the religious uh, um, sort of places and people, but we can start seeing an impact in the language used in the sermons, which is now dropped to uh, almost two, around two um, out of five. But they're still in flux when it comes to the domain of religious um, um, studies or relig religion for the, uh, for the Malays. Because uh, when asked, do you agree to this statement? Um, do I feel more comfortable using Malay? It's sort of three, not very high, but it's still quite high. But then they say, I find it acceptable to use English in my uh, uh, prayers. When making a prayer, it's easier to express certain things in English. So they're agreeing to these statements. Um, they're saying madrasa should only, uh, lessons should only be conducted in Malay. They disagree. Um, so there's, there seems to be still some flux uh, of, um, about what language is most commonly used for the Malays uh, in the religious context. But is it still a domain where the Malay is being kept alive? I think my argument would be that not so much anymore. And maybe that's why things have accelerated so much for the, um, in the last 15 years for the Malays. If we look at, again, as we did before, just to give you some consistency, at the younger age groups, what, who's speaking English? Not as high as the Indians and the uh, Chinese. But the important thing is not so much the number. Again, to look at the differences across the, um, the 15 years, 2005, 2010, 2015. So the trend is definitely an upward one for um, English becoming the home language for the Malays as well, especially uh, with the young ones. And we still see this dip. We see over the, so with it, we're among the three groups where the younger people to the left, they speak uh, uh, English, and then you have that hump in the middle where we think it's the parents um, speaking English to those children um, in that group. Okay, quickly go through. Is there some correlation between education, socioeconomic status? We've looked at the census data, we've done our own surveys, and definitely. What we have is that households who, with higher um, degree of graduates, um, university graduates, they're all from speaking, mostly from speak English speaking homes. Um, the more wealthy Singaporeans, higher income earners, or people who live in really expensive houses, the majority of them are English um, speakers at home. So there's definitely a correlation between English at home and education level um, and socioeconomic status. I'll just breeze through these. The Malays are still, again, in flux. There seem to be more uh, university graduates who come from Malay homes, but that's got nothing to do with the language itself, is really because it's still very underrepresented um, in the uh, tertiary sector. These are the figures, uh, many have graduated from university from each ethnic group, and you can see the Malays have got very few still that have graduated. They're getting a little bit better every year, uh, but still, uh, and that, hence the 56.68% uh, of university educated that come from Malay speaking home. It's really to do with that and not so much a matter of the, the language um, itself. Okay. I, I had a lot of slides here. I didn't want to bore you with too much of the um, theory. We can talk about um, this if we, in question time if we, ha if we have. But um, language Mandolin language shift research, when we look at these things, and as I've shown you, I sort of wanted you to view some of the data before we talked about these things, is that we look at a number of things, like personal characteristics, social factors, what we've seen. We've seen age, we've seen gender, uh, we've, seen, uh, we've talked about socioeconomic status, um, education. Um, there's a context of domains, which um, is obviously still quite relevant in some communities, but doesn't seem to be so much um, in Singapore anymore. Um, is language a core value? How important is uh, a language? Uh, the only ones who seem to still hold that uh, their language is still very valuable to them as a community are the Malays. Um, you'll see that the other two communities really are not that attached um, to either Mandarin, 
goes back to that, what I was telling you before. It's not really the Chinese's real mother tongue. It was given to them, imposed on them, if you want, by the government, saying this is now your new mother tongue. So many of them did not accept it as their mother tongue. The Tamils, the Indians have always been uh, uh, more ambitious. Um, so I think they uh, saw the value of English a lot earlier than the other groups. We could look at it. No one actually has done a national linguistic vitality. Itesh, next time you come to Singapore, bring your questionnaire along. We I've might do that. Sorry? I've got a new one too. Oh, good. OK, because that's another framework that we could use to look at the vitality of these languages. Um, through this approach, it's been uh, um, sort of uh, fine-tuned a number of times, but it's still a very valid um, um, framework. If we go back to the domains, I said, um, really looking, I've looked at all of these domains, and I've given you some of the, the data for this. What we have is really that all the so-called important domains um, They've all been taken over by English. The education system is English. The work domain, everyone, unless you work directly with a Chinese company or something, there are some companies. But they will want a bilingual person. They will not want someone who only speaks Mandarin, for example. All the other places, really, um, they're all dominated by um, English. The last domains that we see, then, for these call them minority languages, call them traditional languages or heritage languages, is the family or home domain. And in some respects, still um, with the uh, uh, Malay uh, for, uh, in the religious domain. Not so much in the other. Uh, we don't see young people wanting to learn Chinese so they can go to pray to the temple or something. That, they don't need Chinese to do that. It's only if you want to talk to a priest, but most of the priests nowadays speak English or, um, as well. Um, so we looked at the family or home domain. We've got a, a new research project that actually Han um, is involved with. We're hoping to get some funding this year from the Singapore government looking at family language policy. This is something that my postdoc just emailed me this morning. He's got some preliminary data from two families. One is a higher socioeconomic status family, someone who earns um, quite a bit of money, and they only speak English at home. But there's two things in this comment that we, uh, are important in the Singaporean context. One is the fact that they see English as the gateway to securing a better job and better, uh, more money, et cetera, et cetera. The other one is that they're really not aware, A, of the value of bringing up their children bilingually, and two, how to bring them up bilingually. Because the government is, again, I don't want to bash them too much, but the advice they give is speak Malay to your children, speak Mandarin to your children. They don't go into the real sort of strategies that we as linguists know that really could work in certain contexts. For example, the one parent, one language, or uh, uh, having constant, uh, frequent immersion trips. Malaysia is only across the border, you know, but no one, wants, they don't want to go to Malaysia to learn Malay. So there's some issues there as far as um, getting these communities, getting you know, some awareness into these communities of how to be, bring them up bilingually and the benefits of it. What we get more and more is instead of families from lower socioeconomic status, they're the ones who still speak the um, traditional language at home. And if we look at some of the, you know, for the Chinese vernaculars, some of the, there were still some blue dots or bars, even for younger age groups, they tend to be families from lower socioeconomic um, status families as well. So that would be an interesting project if we get the funding uh, um, for it. Uh, of course, we, one other thing that we need to look at is, is attitudes. What do the people things, think about the language? What does the majority, uh, in a way, even the government think uh, uh, about the language? Is, are the, is the environment in place to, uh, for these languages to thrive? So the, apart from the Chinese vernaculars, the government is actually quite keen to keep all the languages alive. But keen um, is, a, um, is a very subjective word. Um, I'm a bit more cynical, and I still think that the government doesn't really mind if 95% of the population all became monolingual in English, as long as it's like 5% to fuel the companies that need those bilingual, um, exp the bilingual expertise. They don't mind if everyone else shifted to English. Things would be a lot simpler. You know, they spend millions of dollars every year on 
this so-called bilingual education uh, um, that they have. They do. Uh, but let's have a quick look at some of the attitudes. And you can see the pragmatism in sort of the Singaporeans that comes through. Uh, when asked, uh, this is Tio Chu. Do you like Tio Chu? Is it a nice language? Do you, do you think it helps you build relationships? Very high scores out of five. Do you want to keep it alive? Very high scores across all the, all the questions that you can ask. How useful is it? Very low. And this is, again, it's something that a lot of people seem to miss. There can be a very positive attitude towards the language, but then unless the community itself finds some ways of motivating themselves purely uh, sort of beyond the fact that it's a nice language and it's something that might, uh, from the ethnic group that I belong to, then it's not very successful in maintaining it. So the attitudes can be like that. The Tamils are even a more interesting uh, um, group. They don't care, they say, if they lose Tamil as a language. Their Tamil identity is not tied to the Tamil language. This is, we did, an uh, uh, honors student of mine did a, a project purely trying to uh, look at the Singaporean Tamil identity, and that's what she found. They express their identity in other ways, uh, celebrations, food, movies, whatever, but they don't, this is young Malay, uh, Tamil Singaporeans, they don't mind um, if their children don't um, speak Tamil anymore, as long as other things are still there in the community. One last study, am I doing for time? Nearly there. Okay, I'm taking you through, I don't know, a whirlwind tour of Singaporean languages. I hope you, I'm not speaking too fast from you, but I'm conscious of the time. In 2008, these two people from the National Institute of Education did a, a small little study, and they asked Singaporeans to uh, rate these four items, which they said are central to being Singaporean. So the Singaporean food, Singlish, which is the colloquial variety of English spoken, um, in Singapore, uh, quite distinctly Singaporean, and really if there's one language that unites all Singaporeans, I think the Singaporeans the audience will agree with me, it's Singlish. Um, then the fact that Singapore is clean, and then casuism. Casuism, to me, it's a negative thing, but some people think it's a great thing. It's the Singaporean idea that you have to get the best out of everything and everyone, you know, get the best deal possible. It's called being kiasu. Am I um, explaining it properly? Something like that? Anyway, the thing is, for them, is really they were interested to see where Singlish um, came in this, and of course it came out of top. But this is a really uh, very limited study. Um, we <coughs> took on this idea, we expanded, we had a, quite a large group uh, of Chinese Malay Indians, um, and what we did was we got a group of Singaporeans to come up with 10, uh, no, actually, yes, asked them to come up with five or six um, things that they thought um, they were really proud about Singapore. Okay? So they came up with the fact that Singapore is multicultural, they're actually proud of their uh, ethnicity, meaning that a lot of the identity is tied. I am Chinese Singaporean, I am Indian Singaporean, or I am Malay Singaporean, local food. Sing we threw in the language ones, even if they hadn't given them to us. So we put in Singlish, we put in a more standard variety of English, because Singaporeans speak some very good English. Um, I can understand most of this English, even after 18 years living there, especially if they speak a really uh, local variety, but their standard English, or if I can use that word, yeah, is very, very good. Then the mother tongue, so Malay, Mandarin, uh, and Tamil. Uh, and then for those that, especially for this, the Chinese, we threw in the word dialect in there. Just to Cut a short story short, a long story short. These are the results. It was a ranking exercise, so one out of nine. Um, and we were obviously interested to see where the language, those three uh, or four languages would come into the whole uh, ranking. And Singlish overall came slightly ahead of standard English, and the tongue, mother tongue was quite sort of uh, far behind. If we throw in the dialect for the Chinese, um, uh, it's the last, so no one really ranked it, or they ranked it last out of everything. Um, if we look at only the Chinese, um, we, can have a look, we can have a chat about the top two bars in a minute, but look at the blue bars for now. Singlish and standard um, Singapore English are very closely tied together, and the mother tongue and um, dialect are actually quite close. Okay? 
If we look at the Indians, Singlish is even is sort of much higher uh, than standard Singapore English, but surprisingly they um, they gave uh, Tamil uh, a higher, a uh, quite a high rating. If we look at the Malays, of course, unexpectedly, they're the ones who value their mother tongue the most out of the three groups. To make it easier to compare, I've put them on line graphs. So this is the Chinese, uh, the Malays. So what we see is that they're lower for um, ratings for standard um, English and Singlish, but higher uh, for mother tongue. Um, and the Indians are sort of somewhere in the middle. So just to highlight the mother tongue, standard uh, mother tongue, Malays are highest. Um, standard Singapore English, it's the Chinese or a little bit ahead of the Indians and the Malays at the lowest. At Singlish, we have the Indians who seem to value it more, the Chinese next and the Malays later. Some people can say that maybe for the Malays, because the way Singlish works is it's borrowed a lot from local languages and it's borrowed a lot from Chinese languages as well. Um, so some people say that the Malays, the Singlish that they speak doesn't have so many um, Chinese borrowings, um, so they're not as keen on it as the Chinese are. For us, just as interestingly that came out of this is the group that values their ethnicity the less, uh, the least, are the Chinese. And again, when you ask Chinese, this is quite true. They're distancing. They, you say, are you Chinese? They say, no, I'm Singaporean, especially when they're outside of um, Singapore. It's also a backlash with recent um, immigration policies by the government. Um, uh, we'll see whether I have time to talk about that as well. Who's the group instead that values being in a multicultural society the most? It's the Malays uh, and the Chinese uh, value their Singaporean roots. Again, as a reaction to so many Chinese from mainland China that have been allowed to settle um, in Singapore. Okay, summing up, what do we have? We still have a multilingual generation. Remember this woman? Did you meet this woman, Anne? No? no? We didn't take you to Bollywood Ivy? Yes, yes. Oh, Ivy, Ivy. Ivy Bollywood. Sorry. Itesh, you remember? Yeah, Ivy, yes, it's brilliant. Place. She's amazing, it's but this is. A slightly different name. <laughs> just Ivy Bollywood, probably. Yeah. Um, but this is quite common of this age group where they will speak English because they're um, Singaporean. She's half in Hindi and half uh, Chinese, so she speaks Hindi, she speaks Malay. Again, it's quite common, people in that age group. Um, Cantonese, Hokkien, Teochew, and actually a weakest language claims uh, um, it's Mandarin. So it's really quite common that um, people of this generation or older will be quite multilingual. If we jump down a few decades in age, this is my um, graduate studies office manager, Ivy. Um, she speaks some Hokkien and some Teochew because of her parents, but her strongest um, traditional language is Mandarin. And again, she claims that because of her schooling, not because she, they speak it at home. But English is really her major language. If we look at our new students that come in every year, um, this is a made up person we actually never had. I don't know why I've, Ivy must have gone out of fashion as a name in Singapore. I haven't had an Ivy student. Um, was looking for one, but I couldn't find one. Uh, English, obviously, Mandarin, because fresh out of school. Uh, so, so they do teach these mother tongues at a very high level in the schools. I have to give them that. But she claims that her, or she claims, I have one student who claims, she a number of students who claim their Japanese or Korean is better than their Mandarin um, in first year university. This is an interesting episode that happened in, in my university last year where all the uh, stall owners in the canteens were, received a letter from the NTU management, the Nanyang Technology University management, saying you will change all your Chinese um, signs to English. All of them. I mean, it's always like categorical. Of course, they keep up a fuss and then NTU says, sorry, 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 it was a mistake. The reason why I put it here is because 10 years ago, the, no one would have sent a letter out to anyone saying you have to change. Someone in the office would have questioned this letter and saying, are you sure this is right? You can't do this. And yet last year this letter went out, sort of multiple copies to multiple people without anyone questioning it until the store owners came back and said, what the hell are you doing? Uh, we can't do this. So then they um, changed the policy and said, as long as it's 
bilingual, your menu. You can have any language you like uh, on your menu. But I'm saying that's why things are changing in Singapore, and I saw this as one a symptom of that. Going back to what Lee Kuan Yew said, really, I don't know of any other country where language matters are dealt to at such a high level. Lee Kuan Yew um, was the founder of Singapore. He's been in the, until he died, he was still in the ministry. Uh, but every year, whether it was him or it was another prime minister on a, you know, the national speech that they would give, there would be something about language uh, in that national. I mean, can you imagine your prime minister telling you, don't speak your dialect? Uh, speak she only. Has, she, has it happened? Uh, but this is every year. Anyway, and still there are issues with that. So, but Singapore has had success over the last 50 years. It's undoubtable. Okay, especially if we look at the other countries around Singapore. It really, Singapore is a little diamond that everything, where everything works, compared to the dysfunctional neighbours that it um, it has. And one of the reasons why um, it's had such success is because of the high level of English that the um, Singaporeans hold. That's why they can be a financial hub um, in Asia. That's why they can be a trading hub in Asia when other countries around them uh, struggle. If we project in the future, I'm nearly done, guys, is, um, of course, the so-called dialects are disappearing. As they, people die off, um, there will soon won't be uh, anyone really speaking those languages um, at home anymore. Uh, the promotion of Mandarin will continue, and I'll give you another quote from Li Kuan Yu in a minute to explain this. How much um, Mandarin will still be spoken as a home language, um, we're not sure. We, uh, the trend seems to be that they're stable, but it, that number, I don't know if you sort of realize the numbers, the, it seems artificial, because if you're having um, that sort of vernacular is dropping, uh, English increasing, it's impossible that the numbers should add up that the Mandarin speakers should remain stable. They should be dropping, but they're not. Um, they're not dropping because of what the Singapore policy has. Um, I know it's a lot of text. I tell my students, don't oh, put so much text, break it up. I've tried to get you to read the more uh, um, prominent ones in red and blue. but. This is the government policy. They know they have Chinese population that speaks Chinese or some Chinese, but they're not so worried about the standards of Singaporeans. They know that our homegrown core will be reinforced by a continuing flow of the completely Chinese educated from China, Taiwan, and Hong Kong, who will come to work here, okay, work permit or employment pass, or more importantly as PRs and citizens. And it's these new migrants that are keeping that uh, Mandarin um, percentage at 35. Otherwise, if it was just the Singaporeans that we were counting, it would have dropped. It continues, also we're gonna get lots of Chinese tourists, which is true, so that means we need Chinese uh, people working in, uh, Chinese speaking people in the service industry. And I did say that now there, you know, I've had no problem living in Singapore without Chinese, except for the last few years, where I've gone to some stalls, even at university, and I've asked for something, and the person doesn't speak English, because they're fresh migrants from China. They speak only Mandarin. It's going to take them a while to learn English. Of course, they will. But that's the first time I've, now I've had quite a number of encounters with um, uh, people in the service industry who speak Mandarin and don't speak uh, English. But Li Kuan Yu, just, um, I was digressing this, is Singapore can maintain a high standard of spoken Mandarin because we have a sizable majority of Mandarin speaking Singaporeans. It's not true, it's not sizable anymore. It's dropping every day. But more importantly, there's a significant number of Mandarin speakers, people from China, Taiwan, and Hong Kong they will keep Mandarin alive in Singapore. That's his words. I just highlighted them. So what will happen? Of course, the, whether we're intended or unintended, we have this increase in English um, speakers at home, people who have English as the dominant language at home. And a lot of these kids are having problems now joining the school system. Because, as I said, the school system in Singapore does teach Mandarin or Malay or Tamil to a very high level. Okay, when they 
two years into the program, they, if, you, if they started from zero, they will be fluent um, in whatever language they're studying. This is in primary school, so they really, really um, uh, drive the students hard. Uh, unlike where I come from in Australia, five years of primary school Italian, and they're lucky if they can count to 20 and know a few songs or something. No, that's not the case in Singapore. I think the Singaporeans in your audience can appreciate that. So dominance of English, Singlish will definitely not go away, even the government, though the government has tried to hammer it away, it's not going away, and a definite shift away from the traditional languages. As the closing last two slides, I want to bring you back to 1819, which was probably the earliest grant proposal I've seen that I've read by Sir Stanford Raffles, the sort of the founder of Singapore. He wrote a 25-page uh, proposal to the East India Trading Company to start, the title is a Malay college okay, in Singapore, but what he wanted to do was, I don't know if you can read all the way at the back, he wanted to teach Malay, Bugis, and Siamese. He wanted to teach uh, Chinese, Javan, Burman, and Pali. Okay? He wanted to teach Arabic. And of course, he wanted to teach English and uh, more enlightened subjects like general knowledge and history to, to the elite, uh, the children of the elite in Singapore. Okay? His dream didn't quite happen. His school started, then had to close down, and, but now there is one of the best schools in Singapore. It's called Raffles Institution. Um, so his legacy is there. But more interestingly, I think, I think we should try ending our own um, uh, grant proposals with a statement like this. I'll give you a, a minute to, to read it. What it means by these monuments of a virtue is what I've shown you in the previous slide. The languages, the general knowledge, and English. So while in here, the um, <clears throat> triumphs and whatever will not endure, things will happen to England, England could disappear, but what she brought to this sort of fire outpost that needed educating will persevere. And I think that's a real interesting symbolism of where Singapore is now. <laughs> And with that, I thank you for your attention. Well, thank you very much, Francesco, uh, for a phenomenal, rapid, but I think still something that we can follow. Uh, <laughs> I hope so. All these census data. I mean, that's absolutely incredible. But let me open it for any questions or comments or um, sure. other Any contributions. It I, I just kick things off. It's, it's sure. Uh, I didn't know about that. I, I'm <laughs> was it next week? I can't no, no, it's tonight. Chelsea, it's Barcelona, yes, I know. <laughs> I don't know why the guy mentioned sun on Britain. There ain't no sun here, you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, the, the sun shines on Britain 24 hours a day, or what's the, what's the saying? Uh, anyway, yeah. your question. I think there are two, kind of two related questions. Sure. I think one of the questions I had was, these days we talk a lot about the rise of nationalism mm. around the world, Trumpism, Brexitism, you name it. I wonder how this rise of these nationalisms affects or will affect the types of patterns of language use that are reported. And perhaps associated with that question is, how does the economic rise of China and India and other related, in this case China and India certainly, affect the use of language or at least the use of those languages that we talked about, Mandarin and some of the Indian languages. Interesting, yeah. Uh, interesting um, questions. Nationalism, uh, I don't think it's as uh, apparent um, in Singapore. I'm not saying that Singaporeans are not proud or nationalistic. There are, and the poor male Singaporeans have to go through two years of compulsory national service and two weeks every year or something until they're 35. Um, so, they are obviously very proud of being Singaporeans, but it hasn't transformed um, into the sort of nationalistic movements. I have to say, because then you need to look at why is it in other places you have the rise of sort of the more nationalistic right-wing parties. It, there's no space for that in Singapore. Whatever we say about Singapore, it's a very controlled 
um, country. Is it the Working Party no. no, no, I mean they have a Workers' Party that wins a few seats every. Uh, but I think last um, election it was 90 percent or something. You remember the single point in the votes? So it was anyway. It was the. PAP, the, the, which has been in power since uh, independence, uh, won a landslide um, uh, again. So there's no rise for that, um, for nationalism. I, I, having said that, we have seen some flare-ups because of the influx of a certain type of migrants that the government is letting in, especially the Chinese from mainland China. So some Singaporeans, there's been some very vocal cries about the number and the type of uh, migrants that they led in. Is that a, in a, in a way, a, a show of nationalism? It probably is uh, to, that, to that extent. Um, what was the second question? Why is it China? China. Um, it's important because Singapore has a hell of a lot of money invested in China. Not so much in India, although um, the Prime Minister of India came, I think it was last year, in 2017, finally came with a delegation to Singapore to try and sign some more deals. So definitely China is a huge trading partner and investment partner. So, but what is happening more and more is and the, the government, I think Singapore government hasn't realized or hadn't realized 10, 15 years ago, is that the Chinese are learning English better than the um, Singaporeans are learning Mandarin even though they're growing up with Mandarin and going to school and learning Mandarin at such high levels. So more and more, the relationship with China is not governed or managed through these bilingual Singaporeans, but a lot of them are bilingual Chinese from China. English, and English, yeah. Um, so the importance of the rise in China hasn't um, been felt as much. But there's still that issue that, you know, we were talking about it uh, earlier, remember the sort of the greater China sort of thing. Um, it hasn't affected the majority of Singap Chinese Singaporeans. They don't, yes, and they in a way feel sorry, I think, that they still have to use the term Chinese, but they, whenever possible, they make it an issue to say, no, I'm not Chinese, I'm Singaporean. If you have to use it, it's got to be double-barreled. It's got to be a Chinese Singaporean. Sure. Um, there's been a rapid growth over the last 10, 15 years in particular in China and India of international schools propagating this thirst for English um, sure. in education. Yeah. Uh, so my question is, has that happened in Singapore? And do Singaporean nationals have the right to attend these schools? That's the thing. Yes, lots and lots and more and more opening, simply opening up these international schools. But Singaporeans are not allowed to attend the schools unless they have a, a very good reason, uh, like one of my um, I know that someone, a child lived overseas for the last 10 years, so I, therefore they, they couldn't acquire the mother tongue to the level that they needed to attend local school. They were allowed to attend, uh, but you need special permission uh, from the Ministry of Education. Oh, and then just yeah. follow up question. Yeah. I, I don't know if you're familiar with um, the, 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 the rules of, of languages used within those schools. Do they have to take um, uh, a single The international school? Schools will give um, a range of um, languages, and then it's up to the student to choose. So let's say Mandarin is not compulsory in these schools. No, you can choose. Thank you. Yes? Um, I was interested in that slide that was entitled pra Pragmatism. Yes. <laughs> you want to, want me to go back to it? Singaporeans, is, if I have to if use them, one of the um, sort of... Uh, Curious, that for me doesn't sound like pragmatism at all. It just seems like you've been forced to do something against <laughs> your will. Um, and I was, based on that, what can you envision, and the, the status of different languages at the moment, what can you envision the government forcing people to do? You, know, you mentioned 1957, based on um, not being allowed to, to teach hockey in, this, um, in China before. Um, what, what can you envision more forcing of? more language policies onto it. Uh, that's an interesting, it's a very interesting question. First of all, you know, let me explain the pragmatism, and you're quite right. This is like when you in, in this was uh, forcing something on Singaporeans. But the, why I put it under the slide, uh, under the title of pragmatism, is because Singaporeans are very pragmatic in nature. Of course they can't rebel, it's not a, it's 
sort of country where you can say to the government, no, I'm not going to do it. Uh, um, strike, for example, you have some, uh, who's going on strike? It's illegal in Singapore. So there's no such action available. So Singaporeans are very prepared and say, well, what am I going to get out of this? And they could see, not necessarily like the government wanted to take on, you know, take um, uh, Mandarin as their language, but they could see that, okay, I'm just going to enroll my kids in uh, English. Um, if you, uh, so they're being very pragmatic about a lot of the edicts from the, from the government. Um, in the future, what else they might enforce in Singapore? I don't think there's anything else that they can really enforce that, that I can see. Um, uh, because the, um, the language situation is panning out as it is. The government is letting it. Sure, they're putting money and they're putting a lot of, um, they're doing a lot of lip service to, you know, promote the ever now. Uh, the Speak Mandarin campaign has changed to uh, a Speak uh, Good Mandarin campaign, really. It's not uh, enforcing, uh, it, you know, the, the message is not stop speaking dialects because they know the dialects are all gone, the vernaculars are all gone. But they, in 2000, they launched the Speak Good English movement. But they called it a movement. They made it quite uh, sort of clear that, look, we're not telling you that you have to do this. But, yeah, I mean, once the government starts promoting something, um, Singaporeans being the pragmatic people that they are, they will follow it. So I really can't see what else is there. I'm talking about language-wise. I'm not talking about other um, sort of factors or other aspects of society that the government uh, may uh, intrude on, because there are lots of other things that they're still imposing on from um, sort of the criminal um, side of things and policy, other policies, but that's not for me to comment, I think. I can't see what else they could do with language, so, because they're letting things go, and eventually the, so the vernacular speakers are all going to die out. Um, I said, I don't think they really mind if that 35% of Mandarin speakers drops to 10, 15%, um, because there's all these migrants from uh, the other Chinese-speaking parts of the world that uh, are going to fuel the, the need uh, for Mandarin speakers. So I'm not sure. Uh, I, sorry, I don't know if I can answer that question. <laughs> no, I, was just because, uh, we, we, I think we've had a few talks about, um, about Chris Tan here, um, which, and also heard somebody talking about the Speak Hockey movement in Penang as well. Right. And I was also wondering perhaps if it was a... The so government was, definitely is, government is not doing it. it. No, no. No, no, the government will still not promote any of these. There have been a couple of interventions by the government in uh, some articles written in the New York Times uh, about whether the... Because everyone expected that when Lee Kuan Yew died, actually, that things would quieten down on this front, that maybe Singapore government would... Because there's really absolutely no uh, reason why these Chinese vernaculars should still be banned from... Uh, um, public television, for example. I mean, they allow cable TV, you know, pay TV, and we can, we can listen to programs in Hokkien or in Cantonese from Hong Kong or Taiwan, but not on national television. Everything's still dubbed in Mandarin on national television. Uh, they did um, produce a small TV series, totally in Hokkien, which we thought, okay, you know, the government is really, then is really relaxing. First of all, though, the Hokkien they used is one that no one uses in, uh, uh, in the street. You know, it's, <laughs> It's like, I don't know, depicting a market scene here in London and everyone speaks um, um, uh, RP English or something, you know. Uh, that's the way, so it was really artificial. So not many Singaporeans really took it to heart. But even then, as it, some uh, guy wrote in the uh, New York Times, on, uh, there were two articles, one about languages, uh, the Chinese vernacular, that Singapore is uh, relaxing, and then another one about maybe they're relaxing their stands on Singlish, and the government responded and says that's not true. So you see signs that they are, and then officially don't, or we're not. Why? Uh, I, I don't understand. It's only the old people who speak the vernaculars. Why let them live the last few years, you know, listening uh, to uh, hockey and on the national television? Uh, yeah. Um, Singlish has been actually used in national television. Yeah. Um, in like, I mean, even films, right? National films, you have horse and tans. Um, there was always the sorry to interrupt, but the uh, laws were always that it could not be national television, but films had a special dispensation as long as it wasn't above a certain percentage of the total narrative. But they, no one yeah. went there and actually measured it. But so there were lots of really, really interesting movies with Singlish. Um, yeah. I think there are like television programs, even the news, right? It's like a very famous comedy. 
Yeah. yeah. And it uses a lot of like yeah. English um, yeah. to, you know. But that's what I'm saying. We sent, remember there was, what's his name? I always get his name with the suburb mixed up. Cho Chu Kang. Uh, yeah. Um, he, this famous comedian who used to speak English on television, but then they had to stop, they stopped his series, they, and they made him publicly go to English schools, and then to English school to learn English, and then finally a few years later, as I said, now they're introducing English again. They, English is part of the uh, National Day Parade. There are floats in the National Day Parade every year with these, all these English um, sort of words and slogans on it. But this was only last year that this person wrote, oh, Singapore is becoming more uh, um, relaxed about Singlish. Uh, uh, and then the government responded and said, no, we're not. <laughs> yeah. um, it seems like for me, as a Singaporean, mm. growing up in Singapore, I think there's more like um, people taking ownership of Singlish right yeah. now. Because um, it's a reference towards like a, the Speak Good uh, English campaign. That was movement, a movement. Approach, right? yeah. Yeah, mm. which actually it seems like it felt miserably because it's another policy that wasn't, uh, um, you know, in place. Yeah. And, you know, it's You're still, right. it's, it's still uh, unable to eradicate like, yeah. English. I think the premise yeah. was to, you know, make uh, Singaporeans more fluent in English and stuff like that. That's right. Yeah. And just going back to your question, I mean, there are in uh, private groups starting little, like, you know, speak Hokkien type movements. What do they call it? The, father tongue, there's a father tongue movement as opposed to mother tongue where um, young people are trying to revitalize um, a language like Hokkien but it doesn't have government funding but the government has allowed them I think you know 20 years ago if they tried something like this the government would have snapped them on the wrist and said don't do this when now instead they're just letting them be as long as it's online and it's uh, not affecting anyone in, in a major way I'm thinking of offering Hokkien in and then to you. Sorry, first at the uh, person at the back was first. Then you. <laughs> okay. I, I, um, I was quite surprised to hear that you um, feel the government actually would be quite happy if, if most people um, speak English and, and we don't really develop our mother tongue because there has been a, a drive recently for um, in education within the ministry that they want to improve your mother tongue. They, they want people to speak both, both languages. Um, and so, yeah, I was wondering. Why do you say that? that because the results are not there. This, with the resources that the government has, it's true, as I said, I think I mentioned that um, they do invest a lot of money every year on all the, uh, especially the official mother tongues in Malay, uh, the Indian languages, and, and Chinese. But the numbers speak for themselves. Um, S Singapore has been able to intervene in social issues in such a significant way but they're not having any effect on the Singaporeans learning these mother tongues. The Malays so are switching. Sound Singaporean that way because Sorry? we're very outcome driven and because the outcomes are not there. <laughs> That's why it's, 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 not, um, it's not really the, the case. But, but I, mm. I think my question then is, how would you advise a policymaker in, in the education ministry, for example, or in the social, you know, in CCY? But what would they do? Yeah. To they have been told, they have been told by other experts, not just the, the likes of me, that one of the things they need to do is turn their education system into a real bilingual program. When you have 12 years of English medium education, no matter what else you do, the people who graduate from 12 years of English medium education where their so-called mother tongue is just reduced to a second language, just as a subject at school. All the research shows you, if it's a subject at school, the language will not survive in any community if it's just purely that. So one way would be to do that, turn it into a real bilingual program. But the Singapore Ministry of Education is very scared, of, let's say, starting to teach history in the mother tongue. It may cost more, I don't know. Or you might, or I would take out the mother tongue lessons and invest some of that money in, I don't know, training history teachers and geography teachers in Malay and Tamil. That would be, you need to get young Singaporeans to see that it's not just a school subject. Whether it's Malay, Tamil, that's one thing that I would try and do. But they, as soon as you mention this, you can see their eyes glaze over and say, no, absolutely not. We can't endanger um, our uh, edu uh, um, children's education. And there are many models, huh? there Of course. Models, of course. All kinds of models for education. Yeah. And not practice in Singapore. But that's why I said they still call it we have a bilingual education. It's a misnomer. It's not. So 
in all fairness, I keep saying this, they do teach these mother tongues to a very, very high level. Okay? But even then, they've been relaxing over the years. You, a Singaporean would know. You don't need a mother tongue to go to university anymore. It used to be the case. You needed a mother tongue. You don't need it anymore. Um, there's so many other uh, ways that it's been uh, um, devalued, so, so to speak, in the education system. Yeah. Um, whether you speak um, English or, or Mandarin. And a lot of us go to school when we have um, a good education in terms of the mother tongue and do well in the exams, yeah. but don't speak it because it's not seen as a high status um, yeah. language. Yeah. Um, but would it be possible then to address the issue from a cultural and attitudinal level? Do you think that might work? It might work for the Malays again. That's because I still, they still have the numbers and they still have the attitude that their language is still fundamental to their identity. I don't think that's the case with Chinese Singaporeans, for example. To try and all of a sudden, even with a massive effort, to try and change your attitude towards Mandarin and say you need to value it, I don't think it's going to work. Especially when you're still going through a system that praises um, profic high proficiency in English. All the rewards are in English. You go to university. There's no more mother tongue at university. It's all English. Uh, sorry, she was first. Uh, may I just pose an alternative view to the argument that Chinese vernaculars are dying out, and because then that's because um, the older generation is passing away. Because mm -hmm. I watched an interesting video on how. Some medical students are learning Hokkien, Teochew, and, and like Cantonese in order to reach out to the older generation in Singapore. Yes. Because they, the older generation, they don't speak English, they don't speak Mandarin, they only speak the Chinese vernaculars. There's a large number of them that yeah, do that, it's true. As a result, they refuse to receive medical care because they feel like the medical staff will not understand them. Yes. So, as a result, um, some medical students are learning those Chinese vernaculars in order to reach out to this group of people. Mm -hmm. So I think it's only human, humanistic to learn some of the Chinese vernaculars instead of just letting it go, letting it die out. Yeah, again, it's, uh, they're doing it for a practical reason, for, to speak to these older people who don't speak any other language. But once they die out, there will be no more medical students even learning this language. There will be no need uh, for them anymore. So I don't know whether that's an alternative view. I, I still think as the older people die out, no one will learn, will need to learn Hokkien anymore. Even, even the medical students won't need to learn Hokkien anymore. Yeah, but <laughs> that's also a representation of the culture if it dies out. There is that, uh, but yeah, the culture for Chinese, uh, a lot of it is tied to their ethnic group. You know, I'm Hokkien, and that's my culture, rather than I am Chinese and Mandarin is my um, vehicle to express that culture. Sorry, I know we're running out of time. and stood up. One last question, maybe, in the corner? Um, mm. No, no, mine was just a comment. Um, sure. I wondered whether they, uh, a bit in reaction to you, of looking at the Dutch government's um, uh, drive to promote English with the state funded Klil um, Dutch English schools. Uh, I don't yeah. think you should go there. But, uh, <laughs> the Dutch have about the worst reputation. For language keeping language. languages, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't really want to interrupt that. But, no, that's uh, fine. Thank uh, you, Anne. Francesco, Andy. thank you so much for an extreme. No, I've enjoyed rich myself. It's a great audience. Such massive, a great audience. Thank you. Data. Mm. Um, I, I have literally in hundreds of questions, but we'll deal with that in, a, in another context. I'm also very pleased for all the very good comments, but in terms of the issue around you talking about the dialects and so on, well, we've got a few Singaporeans here. Well, you start speaking to your children exactly. and make sure that they go on. <laughs> it's, it's true. The other thing that I think that is worth really looking at at some stage is uh, not the deep net or the dark net, but what is ha actually happening online. Mm. Because in lots of ways, governments, policies and so on, mm. um, except if they really become big, big, big brother, 
uh, I'm not really going to see what happens there. So go online and write in Hokkien or Teochew right. or something <laughs> like that. Anyway, can we please thank my Francesco? Thank you.